Hey, how's it going everyone and welcome back to another video. In this video, we're going to talk all about neural networks in Python. So we're going to start with an overview of the important concepts. And with neural networks, I really think it's important to understand how they work at a high level. So we'll walk through the basics of how they work. And also we'll go through some information on network architecture, hyperparameters, and activation functions. Once we're done with that, we're going to jump into some code. And so the first coding section, we'll walk through the basics of uh, writing neural networks with the Keras library. And we'll kind of go through some rapid fire examples uh, of actually building models with that. And then the second section will be a real world problem. And so in that section, we're gonna go through building a neural network to automatically classify images as rock, paper, or scissors. Before we get started though, I wanna give a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and that is Kite. Kite is a code completion tool for Python that uses machine learning to find the best suggestions. Kite's completions are sorted by relevance instead of popularity or the alphabet, and it can significantly speed up your development time by completing up to full lines of code. Kite integrates with the most popular Python editors like Atom, VS Code, Sublime, Vim, PyCharm, and Spider. And the best part about Kite is that it's completely free to download. To get started, I've left a link in the description. I've been using Kite for about three or four months at this point, and it's been a lot of fun to use, so I definitely recommend giving it a shot. All right, to get started, let's talk a little bit about why we use neural networks in the first place. And I think that this can be pretty well explained through a couple visual examples. So imagine you have the graph that looks like this, and you know you have these red dots and these blue points, and we're trying to build a classifier to automatically classify red dots and blue dots correctly. So this first example is pretty straightforward. We could simply draw a line between them and get perfect classification. So a more, a slightly more complicated example, imagine we have now these two sets of curved uh, points. In this case, you know, it's definitely not as trivial as the line, but if we use a quadratic equation here, we can once again pretty easily perfectly classify the red dots and the blue dots. But this leads us to the real significant use case of neural networks. And in, in reality, oftentimes our data is not as nicely separated as this. Oftentimes our data looks a little bit more like something like this, where you know <laughs> there's red dots all over the, the, the place, uh, seemingly kind of random with blue dots scattered uh, between them. Visually looking at this graph, we can draw some lines and separate the red from the blue, but training a classifier to automatically do that, that is not so trivial of a task. But neural networks can do this. Neural networks can find patterns and find groups within the data and kind of pull out meaning. And so that's why they're so powerful. So let's get into kind of what a neural network looks like and some of the basics. So using that last example, that last graph is an example. Imagine we're trying to you know, classify blue and red points properly. Well, all neural networks are gonna start with a input layer. And in this case, the input layer would be two dimensional. It would just be the X coordinate and the Y coordinate of the point that we're trying to classify as red or blue. Next, all of our neural networks are going to have some hidden layers. And so this example, we have two hidden layers, each of four, four neurons. All these neurons here are communicating with the input layer. The values from the input layer are being passed through weights in these connections, and then you know red on this side, and then furthermore passed to the next layer. And that finally leads them to being passed to a output layer. And in this case, our output layer would be determining whether something, a dot is red or blue with a certain degree of confidence. Really what a neural network is doing is it's updating these weights between the connections to hopefully be able to properly classify a graph like this. So what's gonna start out is, you know, the neural network is gonna have no idea about how to classify it. It might kind of just draw a line and say, everything to the left of the line is blue and everything to the right is red. And that's not gonna be very accurate, but it gives us a starting point. And so values are gonna be coming through this network and they're gonna have a certain degree of confidence. So let's say we are looking at a red example here. Our neural network should give us kind of predictions like with 55% chance it's red, 45% chance it's blue. And what we're trying to get is that that percentage value, that confidence value here 
is as close to the actual values. So in this case, if we were looking at a red example, this would be a one and this would be a zero. Based on this calculation, we're gonna see that, okay, we weren't one and zero as we were supposed to be. There was some loss involved and we're gonna tell the weights to update accordingly. And that's gonna lead us to kind of a new separation in our data. And uh, once again, our, you know, our values as we get more and more examples are gonna be updating and we're gonna to start to get more confident about what's coming in. And we're gonna keep updating this graph and the values are gonna get kind of more and more um, confident if there is actually a, you know, a separation in the data, they'll uh, kind of converge to better and better values. And ultimately we hope that if we train it enough, we get something that looks like this, where the data seems to be pretty well fit by our network and values that come through it will be pretty confidently predicted as red or blue correctly. If you want a really good visual explanation of how these neural networks work, I definitely recommend checking out the video series that 3Blue1Brown did on the topic. He animates it beautifully and uh, it definitely can help drill down some of these high level concepts before we move into actually coding networks. Next, let's talk about the hyperparameters of this network. There's several different aspects that we're kind of able to adjust within our network. I think the, the most obvious one is going to be the number of hidden layers and the number of neurons per layer. Uh, some of the other ones are going to be the batch size. So how many data points are we passing through the network each update step? So we're not gonna be passing in a single point usually. We're gonna maybe be passing in 16 points uh, into our network or 32 or 64. Uh, so the batch size determines that. Uh, optimizers, so how does our network learn? And it's an algorithm to update the neural network. And one thing I wanted to note is that you can usually use Atom as a pretty safe bet to your optimizer. And that also leads us to the learning rate. So how much do these weights update each time we see a batch of, of inputs? And so if you adjust that higher, it's gonna update uh, with greater magnitude. If it's a lower learning rate, updates are gonna be smaller. So we can play around with that as a hyperparameter. Another hyperparameter that's important to note is dropout. So one thing that we find helps our networks generalize better is if we randomly basically disconnect nodes with a certain probability. Basically what this is doing is that if we're dropping out nodes randomly, the rest of the network has to step up, do more and influence more. It can't rely on a single node to, to learn everything. And this helps because we're not gonna see all the data that's in the wild and dropout kind of helps us simulate some of those conditions that we can actually see on our own. Another important hyperparameter to know is epochs. And that is how many times are we going through our data while we train it? So this is another parameter that you can adjust. So a question that's asked a lot is you know, how do we choose these layers, the neurons, the hyperparameters? Well, the biggest thing I would say is use your training performance to guide your decisions. Uh, if you are getting a high accuracy on training data, but not on a validation set, then you're kind of overfitting to your, you're overfitting to your training data and you probably should reduce the number of parameters. Um, if you're getting a low accuracy on training, like a relatively low accuracy, and you think you can boost that up, you might be underfitting the data and maybe you should increase the number of parameters. And what I will mention is that there's no exact science to this. It's gonna be a lot of kind of tweaking numbers and tweaking values. And that's just the nature of building neural networks. And don't worry that if you don't feel like you are confident about everything you're doing. A lot of it is just playing around and testing things. And then another way we can choose um, hyperparameters is using some automatic search methods to kind of help test us, help us test a lot of different values at once and ultimately choose the best combo of things. And so with like sklearn, you could use grid search CV to help us do that. And I think we'll get to that uh, in the actual coding section of the tutorial. One thing I haven't mentioned yet, but are very important to how our neural networks function are activation functions. Activation functions introduce nonlinearity into our network calculations. And that might not make mean anything to you, but what that really comes down to is, in like our example here, what we were doing, if we were trying to build a network around this data, is ultimately we're taking our node values, so our kind of input values, multiplying them by some weight, and adding all those values together uh, to get kind of the output of the node. And what an activation function does is it allow it to this node value, instead of just adding uh, input values times weights, 
it adds this nonlinearity and basically adds complexity into the values that we output out of that node. So to kind of sum that up, it, the activation function is what allows us to fit our neural networks to more complex data and do some really exciting things. So it allows us basically to fit to data that looks you know, more complex like this uh, more easily. And another question I hear asked a lot is, what activation functions sh should I use? Well, in general, I would say it's a pretty safe bet to go with the ReLU uh, in your hidden layers. There's this concept in neural networks called vanishing gradients. Basically, when you're updating those weights and how far back you can update the weights and learn from your training data, ReLU activation function helps uh, avoid that vanishing gradient problem. So in general, I would say for hidden layers, ReLU is a safe bet. And then what I would say though is for your output layer, um, if you're classifying a single label, you're doing like you have you know red, blue, yellow, green, and you just need to classify each point as one of those, softmax is a good bet. Um, but if you wanted to maybe classify things could be red, and blue at the same, like they, they could be both red and blue. Uh, for multi-label classification, the sigmoid activation function is a pretty good bet. And then the last thing I wanna get into before we jump into code is a quick overview of TensorFlow slash Keras uh, versus PyTorch. And in this tutorial, we're gonna be using Keras and it's great for getting started quickly and really rapid experimentation with neural networks. You're gonna find as you get more and more advanced that it lacks the complete control and customization that PyTorch and kind of the more full version of TensorFlow has. TensorFlow has been historically the most popular framework for industry, but I would say that it can get pretty complicated and the documentation for it isn't always consistent. Myself personally, I'm not the most experienced with TensorFlow. What I'm usually using if I'm doing more complex neural network stuff and what I used for my master's thesis ultimately when I was working on different types of networks is PyTorch. And this has kind of been for a while the favorite of the research and academic community. It has a very Pythonic syntax and you can easily access uh, values at any point in the network. To start off the coding section of this tutorial, I would say the best way to learn is by doing. So we're gonna jump straight into some examples of building neural networks. And through that, you should kind of build up the fundamentals of what you need to know uh, with TensorFlow and Keras. So if you go to my GitHub page, github.com slash keithgalley slash neural dash nets, and this is linked to in the description, I've left some examples there. So we're gonna build a neural nets for each one of these examples in this folder. And what the task is, is just like what I introduced at the start of the video. So we'll start with this linear example and just basically write a simple neural net to properly classify the red and blue points. So let's download this uh, GitHub repo. And there's two ways to do this. I would recommend forking it and cloning it locally. And I have instructions on how to do that right here. Uh, but the other option you can go with is just simply downloading the zip and then take this and extract it to wherever you want to write the code. The last thing I'll say before we start writing code is make sure you have TensorFlow installed. And probably the easiest way to do that is by installing the Anaconda distribution. And so I'll have a link in the description on how to install that. All right. And I'll be using Sublime Text as my editor, but we'll wanna go into that folder that we just created, wherever you extracted your files or cloned your files. And I'll start out by um, going into the examples, going into linear, and just saving a, fold, uh, a file called networklinear.py. So when we're writing a neural network, the first thing I always is going to be to import the TensorFlow library or the PyTorch library if you're using that. And specifically for this example, we're using Keras. So we're gonna import Keras from TensorFlow. So from TensorFlow import uh, Keras. So that is good. Then we'll probably wanna also import some helper libraries. So um, I think the ones will be important right now are to import pandas as PD and import numpy as NP. And one thing I wanna quickly mention is I'm using Kite Copilot over here. So it's a really nice feature of Kite. And basically as I type things out, uh, this will follow my cursor 
and pull up documentation on the associated uh, code. All right. And the other thing to note real quick is that in that same linear folder that has the uh, picture of the example and where we just saved our file, there's also two data files. There's a training data set and a test data set that is producing the graph that you see here. So we need to load that, da that data. So our file is right here. So we're gonna have to go into data and then load in training to start. And then we'll also do the same with the test. So we'll load in the CSV file with pandas. So we'll do pandas.readcsv. And then the path I just showed you was the data folder and then train.csv file. And I'll make all this code slightly bigger so you can see it more clearly. And we'll probably wanna save that as something. So we'll just call this the training data frame equals that. And we can confirm that it's loaded by doing traindf.head. Oh, and we should probably print that. Okay, cool. So yeah, we have an X point, Y point, and then the color. And the color is just a zero or one argument here. So we have it loaded in, that's good. So now we can go ahead and actually build a neural network around this training data. And to do that, we'll wanna start out by defining a Keras sequential type. And what this sequential is saying is that we have a certain number of layers in our neural network. So this sequential here is allowing us to list the different layers that we have in our network. So we're gonna go ahead and start defining layers. And so to access layers in Keras, you can do keras.layers. And then all the types you see here are different types of layers you can add. We're focused on a fully connected feed forward network. And that's gonna be defined by this dense keyword. Next, here are a couple different things we can pass into dense. And you can see uh, these different keyword arguments over here in the right in the uh, Kite Copilot window. But the first thing that, the only thing that's required is the number of units we want to use. And with this, what you're going to want to do is actually define your first layer as your first hidden layer. And you'll see why in a second. But I can say, Four. Let's say we just want four no neurons in our first hidden layer. Next thing we're gonna pass in, and I'm looking at this documentation to kind of guide me a little bit too, is the input shape. So we can actually pass in our input shape into this layer. And so our input, if we remember, is X and Y. So that's gonna have a single dimension of two. Then another thing we can pass into this dense layer is our activation function. And as I mentioned at the start of this video, usually a safe bet for the activation is a ReLU unit. And there we go. We've now defined a input layer of two no neurons that feeds into a hidden layer of four neurons. And that hidden layer of four neurons has a ReLU activation. And then Let's say, let's make this first example because the data is very simple. Let's make our first example very uh, simple. And we're just gonna feed this in, this one hidden layer into our output layer. And our output layer is two because colors can either be red or blue. And in our data, this looks like zero or one. But right here, that's our first neural network. It's a two no neurons to four neurons to two neurons. So let's actually fit our model to that. And we're gonna first want to compile our model. And this is gonna tell us how to train it. So we're gonna to wanna to use the Atom Optimizer. And you'll see, uh, again, with this compile, oftentimes I forget the exact syntax of how to write these Keras networks. But if I go to compile, uh, and then I look at my notes over here, we see we need to pass in an optimizer. The safe bet here is to use Atom. And then next we can go ahead and define a loss function for our network. And to do that, we're gonna to want to go keras.losses. And then we'll see we have a couple different options here. Uh, but with losses specifically, I think sometimes it's, it's nice to get a little bit more information. And if I click on these, it doesn't tell us too, too much about the uh, type of loss here. So what we're gonna go do is actually go to the TensorFlow documentation and I'm on the losses page. And as you can see, there's a bunch of different options. 
And the two popular members we saw here was categorical cross entropy and sparse categorical cross entropy. And it's unclear to me, just reading that, uh, what the difference is here. So that's a good thing we can kind of check uh, on the losses page in the TensorFlow documentation. So first, I'll click on categorical cross entropy. So it computes the cross entropy loss between the labels and predictions. Uh, so as you can see here, this was 0.9, this was 0 0.05 and 0 0.05, the actual was 100. So it compute the loss on that. Um, you know, the differences between that. And that sounds pretty good. But the one issue we have here is the way that these are encoded is a little bit strange. Uh, they're, call, they're encoded in what's called one hot representations. So basically this is saying label one, this is saying label two, this is saying label three. And in our data that we were looking at, this was a float value of just zero or one. So what's going to be good for us to do here is actually check what that sparse categorical cross entropy was. And the difference between the two is it says the same exact thing as the last loss, but the key difference here is that it says use this cross entropy loss when there are two more labels, and that's good for us. And we expect the labels to be provided as integers instead of uh, one hot representation. So we can uh, pass in integers here and we don't have to encode them in one hot representations. So that's good for us. So we'll define that sparse categorical cross entropy. So I'll do dot sparse categorical cross entropy. And let's see, define it like this. And to be honest, I, if you saw the autocomplete, it was suggesting I format it like this. And I don't quite know the difference between this. I just know in all the examples that I've worked through, I define it with this representation. And then the last thing with this that we will want to say is that from logits equals true. Um, so if I go back to the losses, uh, that was one of the options we had with the sparse categorical cross entropy. And if you are curious what from logits equals true means, uh, I always recommend, you know, go ahead and do a Google search on this uh, question. And as we see, uh, I was going through the TensorFlow API docs here and TensorFlow documentation, they use a keyword called logits, what is it? Well, uh, we found a nice little answer here and it simply means that the function operates on the unscaled output of earlier layers and in particular, that the sum of the inputs may not equal one. And that's what we want because we're using values that aren't necessarily one. Like if you look at our uh, input values here, you know, these aren't going to be between zero and one. So we want to use the from logits equals true keyword. And then the last thing we want to keep track of is a metric. And we're going to use the metric of accuracy to see how our network does when we evaluate it. So there we have compiled uh, how the network's gonna be tra trained and learn. So it's using the atom optimizer that is figuring, it is updating, oh shoot, I see I left a I out of optimizer, that updates the network based on the sparse categorical cross entropy loss function. Now that we've done that, we can actually go ahead and fit the training data to our network. So as you can see here, it's expecting an X, a Y, and a batch size. So our X values here are going to be the X and Y coordinates and the values associated with them. The Y value here is going to be the color, zero or one. And the batch size, we can kind of set how big we want that to be. So let's just say batch size equals 16 to start. So now what are X and Y? Well, looking over here at the documentation, we see that the argument X is the input data and it's expecting a type of a NumPy array or a list of arrays. You also could pass in a TensorFlow tensor uh, or a list of tensors. And then it, there's a couple other options. We're gonna focus on that NumPy array. And 
So right now we have our data in a data frame, which obviously isn't a NumPy array. But what's really nice is that we can easily convert the data frame from pandas into a NumPy array by just doing train df dot the column that we want to access dot values. And so this will get the data in NumPy form. And I can show you that by doing 0 to 5 and train df dot x dot values, we can surround this with a type. And then we can print both of these things out. And print out this. And I'm just going to quickly comment all this out so it doesn't run. See, these are our x values in numpy form. And the type is numpy. So we see that that is correct. So let's go ahead and start passing things into our network. And note, we could have done the same exact thing with the color label and also the Y values. And just to help us out, I'm going to also print out that data frame again. So for our Y value, that is the color. So we can go ahead and fill in train df dot color dot values to get that in numpy form. X is a little bit tricky because it's not only the X value, it's the X and the Y value because both of them are important in influencing whether or not graph something is red or blue dot. So what we're gonna have to do here is actually stack those columns together so that they're paired up. So I'll say X equals numpy dot column stack and we want to stack the values that are in the x column, x.values to get it in numpy form, and the values that are in the y column, train df.y.values. So now what this is doing is it's pairing up this as the kind of first input, this as the second input, this is the third input. All of these columns the X and the Y column are now paired together with this column stack command. And I can just pass in X here. That's cool. All right, before we run this, let's do one last sanity check on our code to make sure that we didn't miss anything. So we load in the data. We build the model around the data. We set up loss for our network. And then we prepare our X values. And one thing I do notice that we forgot to do, and this is very, very important whenever we're training a deep neural network, and that is shuffle our training or our training data. So this is important because as we have it now, all of these zero labeled colors are right in a row. And basically when we're updating our network, we'll have highly correlated examples right next to each other. And our network is not gonna have a uh, real idea of what the data looks like in the wild. So it's very important that we shuffle our data. And the easiest way to do that is going to be to do np.random.shuffle and we can pass directly in train df dot values to have it shuffle everything that's in the train df data frame. And this shuffle method works in place, which means we don't need to reset train df to be the result of that. It will update behind the scenes. All right, so now we've shuffled it and we can confirm that it's been shuffled by rerunning train df dot head. And notice, before we had all zeros and now we have ones uh, mixed with zeros. So we know that the order is now flipped. That's good. Anything else we miss? And one other thing I noticed is that let's add an activation to our uh, output layer. And with this, what I mentioned was good is to either use for, for the binary classification task, we can either use sigmoid or softmax. So let's use sigmoid in this case. Um, it won't really matter for this specific example. And with that, I think we're good. Oh, okay, I just went through one time on the data. And as you can see, uh, it classified 70% of the examples correctly. Let's see what happens if we decrease the batch size. Okay, it does a lot better uh, if it's learning on a smaller number of examples at a time. Um, another thing we could try doing is maybe make this a little bit bigger. And as you can see, it, it really uh, can learn quickly when we made it bigger. Uh, let's reset it to four. And these are the types of hyperparameter testing we're going to do. 
in addition to batch size, let's specify the number of epochs. Let's say five for epochs. And look at that. Um, with the current settings we have here, the network can classify 100% of our training examples correctly. And that makes sense given that our data looks like this. It should be pretty easy to classify that. Uh, the last step we want to do here, though, is actually evaluate on the test data. And we can do this very similar to how we loaded in the training data. We'll say test df equals pd.readcsv of dot slash data slash test dot csv. And then we can say that uh, test x equals np.column stack of the test df dot x dot values and test df dot y dot values. It doesn't actually matter that the test data is shuffled because when we're evaluating a model after it's been trained, you know, we're not updating the network anymore. So the order doesn't matter anymore because it's just performing classification on the net, the weights that have been set in the network. Uh, so test x. And then to evaluate, we can use model.evaluate. And we'll want to evaluate test x on the test x label. So that's going to be test df dot values, or sorry, dot color dot values. So it's training again. And then the final step here is the evaluation. And as you can see, this bottom part here is the evaluation run. And as you can see, and I can just confirm that by doing print uh, evaluation. It's training again. And as you can see, evaluation, the stuff below that, it does 100% accuracy on the test examples. Cool, so that was example one. Let's rapid fire go through some more examples. The easiest way for us to test the next example is just to just save this file somewhere else. So instead of the linear example, we'll go to, how about the quadratic example, and we'll save network dot quadratic py here. So this is the same exact uh, network as before, but now instead of the linear data, we are training it on the quadratic data that looks like this. All right, so right off the bat, one thing that's nice is uh, how well would it do given the current network setup? So now this is running on different data because we're running this function in that different folder. And as we see here, okay, it only got 78% accuracy on this new data. And with this graph, you know, we've added more complexity into the classification process. So what we're probably gonna have to do here is add more, com more layers into that hidden layer, uh, hidden layer of the neural network. So what happens if we bump it from four to 16? And as you can see, when we bumped it from four to 16, uh, it did 90% accuracy. So that was significantly better than before. Uh, what else could we do here? I mean, we could honestly keep going up with this. We could just say 32 here. And now it's classifying 95% of the training examples correctly. And maybe we would even learn more if we uh, bumped this up to 10 epochs. So now we're running through the training data more and more times. And as you can see, we're near perfect. We're at 98% accuracy. This is a type of task we should be able to get 100% accuracy on because there's such a clear separation in the data. So as one additional thing maybe we want to do is add a dropout layer. And what we need to draw, 
put this in here is a percentage that ran, nodes are randomly dropped out. So let's say 0.2, 20% is a common value you'll use for dropout. Need out a comma. So now it goes from the hidden layer, it, it drops out 20% of that 32 uh, node hidden layer. Okay, so that actually didn't improve our model. Another option we have would be to add another fully connected layer. So layers.dense. Let's say maybe we add another layer of 32 nodes, also with an activation of uh, ReLU. And maybe that will give us 100% classification. But honestly, we're very close to what we're looking for. And look at that, yeah. It didn't get all the training examples correct, but on the 1,000 um, test examples, it got all of them. So yeah, that's a pretty good setup, it seems like, for the quadratic example. And let's just keep this going. Next, I recommend saving this file as, uh, we'll go to the clusters example. So network clusters.py will save this as. And let's just look at the clusters uh, data or the graph for the clusters. It looks like this. And so I think the one big thing to note here is that instead of now just red and blue uh, dots, we're classifying six different colors. Uh, so go ahead. I would recommend trying this one on your own and seeing if you can tweak the network to get it to work for all six colors. And note, you might have to actually dig into the data a little bit because there's a slight nuance in this example on uh, how we do that. So maybe pause for a sec, try to do this on your own. All right, so I think right from the get-go, we've saved this file in that correct directory. Last time we could just immediately run our file in the new spot and it just would work pretty well. And here we have an issue, it looks like. Let's see what our issue is. Now, what could this issue be? Well, let's actually look at the data real quick. and. I think it's safe enough that we could actually just look at what we printed out at the start of this. And here's the big difference with the last one. Right now, we have colors that are written out as strings. And so when it gets down to the fitting over here, it's not gonna know how to handle that. Um, so we're gonna need to convert these strings that we have in our training data that we see printed here into a, a numpy array, so probably just convert strings to colors, do some sort of mapping. So that's not too hard. So we can just do print train df dot colors dot unique to get all of the different colors that we have. And I'm going to comment all this out real quick. So just color. Okay. Red, blue, green, teal, orange, purple. So all we're gonna do is just do a dictionary mapping from the string to a integer number. So we can just do something like color dict equals, and we'll say red maps to zero, blue maps to one, uh, green maps to two, uh, teal maps to three, uh, orange maps to four, and finally purple maps to five. And so once we have this deck, now the next thing is to actually apply it to our data frame. So we can do train df color, we're changing the color column, equals uh, train df dot color dot apply and this is gonna apply a lambda function on this. So I'm gonna say lambda x, which is gonna say everything, for every x cell in the color column, we want to change the color column to the color dict of that string. And as we will see when we print this out again, now the colors are zeros and the unique colors are zero, one, two, three, four, five. That looks good. 
So with that, we can literally uncomment our model. And we should be able to run this. Guess not. Oh, interesting. We have one more issue, it looks like. Received a label of five, which is outside the valid range of zero to two. Um, so the other thing that we have to actually change is before we were just classifying two labels. So now we need to change this last layer to be six because there's now six different labels we could have. Look at it go. Getting up there. Oh, and then we also we had the same issue here with the test data frame. So we'd also want to that same processing that we did to the test data frame or the train data frame, we'll also want to do to the test. And now we'll see that it should give us some test performance here. Okay, 97% accuracy on the test data. That's pretty dang good. And the last thing I really do want to say real quick is in addition to evaluate, sometimes it's nice for us to just predict what the output will be for a single point. So I could use the model.predict function here and I could pass in, well, it's, our type is a numpy array, um, which is a list of two-dimensional values. So let's just pass in a value like two comma two. If we look at our chart, two comma two, right? Maybe not two comma two, let's do zero comma three. That should be a purple point. So it should map to uh, the number five, I believe from that color dict we were just talking about. Yeah, purple is five. So let's see if the prediction gives us five. And ultimately like when we're using these neural networks out in the wild, this is what we're gonna be using. Like incoming data, we would have to predict the value and use that as like kind of the, the truth as long, and as long as our model is trained well, uh, you would think that it would hopefully be giving you the correct prediction. And you can use that however you want in your applications. <laughs> okay, well, it, it gives us all this information. It might be a little bit hard to read this. Uh, what you could do is um, do np.round and then just have it round up to the nearest integer. And so whatever one's closest to one would be ultimately your prediction here. Yeah, and as we can see, the prediction is um, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not, it's the sixth value. So that's what we were looking for, it was purple. Cool, that looks good. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, for the next example, let's go ahead and save this file as network clusters, we'll just say underscore two, meaning uh, two categories. And when I say two categories, uh, I think it's nice to look at the data for this. So first off, let's look at the figure. Um, it looks like this. And as you can see in this case, in addition to having a color, they also have a marker. So what if we wanted to not only in our neural net predict the color, but also predict the marker. So like a plus sign here, a star here, triangles here and here. Uh, how could we do that? So now we're predicting two labels instead of one, and that's gonna change up what our network looks like. So again, feel free to try this on your own, but this one's definitely gonna be trickier, so it might not be as straightforward. And just to show you, the data would look like this, where now we have X, Y, red, and some sort of marker. So we're gonna have to convert all these into kind of more numerical. Well, we'll have to convert the, the color and the marker to some sort of vector representation, uh, and then be able to predict two things at once instead of just one. 
So this will definitely change things up. All right, um, so now it might not make sense to do this color deck because now we need to predict two things at once. What I recommend we do is go ahead and now instead of passing in uh, like just integer numbers, we're gonna ultimately stop using the sparse categorical cross entropy and use just the categorical cross entropy. And the difference here is that if you see what I type on the screen, before it was expecting things like three to be passed in. Now we're gonna use labels that are vectors. So just to show you, what we want to get is have the first three labels represent the six different colors. Yeah, have the si first six labels represent the first the six colors that we can output, and then have the last three labels represent what the marker is. Um, so how that, what the marker is in the graph. So what we can do here is pandas actually has this function called get dummies that can convert labels, unique labels, into this kind of one hot encoding representation. So we're gonna utilize that. So I'm gonna delete the color dict for now. I'm gonna delete this. And now what we're, we're gonna do is get our labels. So I'm gonna say one hot uh, color equals pd.getdummies and we're gonna pass in train df dot color. And then, so this will can get it in a data frame form, but we want it in a numpy form. So we're gonna do that get values. And just to show you what that looks like, one hot color. <laughs> and, and one hot is the encoding. It's what you call like a encoding like this, where uh, you have a one with the truth of where the label is. And I'll comment the rest of this stuff out quick. I also have to delete this now. I guess I could, uh, if it would be helpful, comment that out. Keep it on the screen. Oh no, I don't want to print the whole thing. As you can see though, uh, now it's each of these values for the colors is encoded uh, as can be seen here. So we can do the same thing for the marker. It's gonna be pd.getdummies, train df, dot marker dot values. And then what we're gonna have to do is concatenate the two. So we want to append this with the three values that are going to be found for marker. So we'll do np dot concatenate. Then we'll pass in one hot color and one hot marker uh, on the first axis, and this will be our labels. That's good. And now it's a little bit trickier to do the shuffling like we were doing before, um, just doing train df dot values because our labels are now separate from our data frame. So I'm actually not gonna do this right now. We're gonna shuffle later. Uh, let's uncomment everything. And let's see, maybe we'll keep the data frame. Now let's shuffle down here where we actually get our X values. And this is now gonna be labels instead of X. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do np.random.shuffle X and np.random.shuffle of the labels. And the one thing to be careful here is if we separate out how we shuffle these, we need to make sure that they're shuffled in the same order. So what we can do to this is, because it would be terrible if we shuffled our input, like our X values and shuffled our labels in a different order, then they wouldn't actually match up with the truth. So we would have a really hard time building a neural network around that. So what we can do is random state seed equals 42, let's say. It doesn't matter what we set this seed to. But basically this is just ensuring that in our random shuffle, that the same shuffling is happening in, happening in both places. Uh, and now uh, we can go ahead and fit our data. 
comment all of this out temporarily. A target array 6009 was passed for an output of shape none six. Huh, using loss categorical cross NGP. Okay. That looks like it's pointing to this as an error. And now that we're concatenating not only our color, but also with our marker value, we need to make this nine. So now we're predicting, you know, a color in the first six cells of that neural network and a marker in the last three. Oh, wow, brutal. And look at this, this is really not good. Uh, we got 12% accuracy on the task. Uh, obviously, we want to do better. And when you have, we do something this bad, you know, something's wrong with our network. So it's a matter of figuring out what, going through and making sure that like the labels properly look like they should might be one thing to do. Um, like this, let's just confirm that label zero looks kind of... Yeah, this looks good, so that's good. What else could be going wrong? Another thing I might look at as being a possibility of what's going wrong would be um, the shuffling here, making sure that they're shuffled together. If they're not shuffled right, it's gonna be really hard to learn anything because it's not like truthful data. It's probably just kind of random uh, pairings of things. But we seeded everything here, so that looks good. And here is the issue, is that we're using cro categorical cross-entropy loss. And this is expecting only one thing to be the label instead of the possibility of multiple things being the label. As a result of that, all we have to do to really fix our network is change this to binary cross-entropy. And what binary cross-entropy is gonna do is that in the output layer of our network, now we're kind of gonna be predicting each of these positions independently of the other positions. So we can have multiple things be one or zero. Like we can have both this be one and this be one. So let's see how that fixes our model. And look at that, yeah, way better accuracy. 90%, that's, yeah, significantly better. Um, if we wanted to do the test, we would go ahead and just basically, um, we don't need the color dict anymore. We do the same processing that we did up here. Just copy all this. We'll say test one hot color, test one hot marker. This is test DF, this is test DF. and test labels. And now we're evaluating on test labels. And because we only got 90% accuracy, I think we could maybe need some more parameters. I'm gonna bump these up to 64 neurons per layer and see if maybe that helps things too. Uh, because there's more, more things we need to learn here. So it might need a little bit more parameters. Uh, and we'll also just do a fun prediction so let's look at what we should expect. Um, zero three would be purple and a star. And we would have to probably like, if we wanted to really utilize this in the wild, we'd have to do one additional step of basically uh, converting our one hot encodings back to a string. But I'm gonna kind of skip over that uh, for now. Yeah, that's pretty good. 93% classification. And I'm sure if we wanted to, we could like maybe bumping this up would help. Uh, notice too that um, we got this prediction down here. And if we wanted to kind of just sanity check that things were working well, we could maybe classify things in three different spots. So zero one would be arrow uh, and red. Negative two one would be a plus and green. So let's pass in those two. Zero, one, uh, and negative two, one, I think was the last one. Negative two, one would be plus. Let's see what happens with these predictions. I'm actually gonna make this four. It 
And look at that. So we don't actually have the string representations, but we can see that uh, they all classified them as a different color. And all, in the last three things, they all were a different marker. So that looks like things are good. And also our accuracy tells us that things are pretty good. And for the sake of time, the next step would be, I would say, to con be able to convert these back into their string representations. But that's more of a Python task than a uh, specific neural net task. So I will leave that for you guys to try to do. As a final example and kind of a, to bring this video full circle, the last thing we're gonna do is build a neural net to classify the data that was introduced at the start of this video. And to do that, let's again open up our uh, quadratic example and just save that now, just because the, the actual problem is very similar to the quadratic problem over the uh, categories problem we just did. Save that as network complex dot py. Okay, and so right off the bat, let's see how our quadratic network does on the more complex data that's it here. One last reminder. Okay, so right off the bat, it actually classifies 80% of those, about 80%, 79% of those points correctly. Uh, so how can we do better? Well, I think it's as easy sometimes as, let's increase the number of parameters. Let's maybe add a dropout layer. Let's maybe add another one of these. So we'll have three hidden layers. Um, we're gonna increase our batch size just so it goes a bit quicker. Um, all right, maybe we'll make this like 256. We'll, we'll really increase the parameters here. All right, let's see how that now does. Oh, Keras. All right, come on, come on. Okay, 81%, that's better. I wonder if, you know, increasing this even more would help, like how many parameters do we really need? And I guess here's the balance of, you know, we don't wanna uh, overfit too, so we wanna make sure that our test accuracy stays pretty high, and you know, the test actually here was 81%, um, and the training was 80, so didn't we didn't lose any generalizability there. Hmm, that actually decreased performance. Maybe we drop this back down drop these down. Maybe we try making the dropout a bit higher. So let's say 0 0.4, 0 0.4, and maybe just go through the data more times with this higher rate of dropout and maybe that will help us more generalize. And look at that. Uh, that time, I think with this added dropout here, we did the best that we have done. We didn't overfit it too, too much. And we also learned more because we dropped out nodes at randomly and forced these nodes in this network uh, to do more on their own. So that's a pretty good, I'm pretty happy with that with 84% on the test set. I might just as a last thing, add the dropout to that final hidden layer as well and just see if that um, does anything. It doesn't seem like that improved anything. So we'll just keep it at this. And I think this is a pretty good solution. We might not get 100% on this last task. I do recommend if you want to try to keep uh, you know, tuning these parameters, see if you can do better and better. But I think that's gonna be the ending point of this video. A couple of things we're gonna say before we conclude is that this took longer than I expected. So we're not gonna have time to do the rock, paper, scissors example in this video but I'll bring that out into a part two video and kind of make that its own real world example video. Another thing we'll do in that next video is look at how we can automatically select some of these parameters instead of manually setting them. And then also I just wanna say, you know, what are next steps where you can kind of take your neural network skills to the next level? Well, I recommend looking at, in addition to these fully connected layers that we were working with, look at other types of networks. Look at, uh, you know, RNNs, look at, uh, convolutional neural networks and building networks around 
those types of things. That's a, one good thing. And then another thing you could do is for all the examples we went through today, maybe if you want to learn PyTorch, uh, you could try doing, try implementing the solutions with PyTorch instead of Keras. All right, that concludes the video. Thank you all for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And if you haven't already, make sure to throw this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Also, I want to mention real quick, uh, if you enjoyed uh, watching me use Kite, definitely check out Kite and download Kite uh, in the link in the description. Feel free to also check me out on my socials, Instagram and Twitter. All right, that's all that we have. Till next time, everyone. Peace out.